Hello, everyone. We're so glad you joined us for another episode in the Lympha Press Educational Webinar Series. We started a minute before one because we want you to be able to log on because we've got lots of information to share. And we are so delighted to have Dr. Heather Hetrick with us again. Every time Dr. Hetrick, every time you do a webinar with us, I get so many emails afterwards saying the analogies she gives are amazing. I finally grasped something complex because of the way you put it. So that is one of your claims to fame. There are many. Thank I would you. love to do an actual formal introduction. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hetrick is a professor in the physical therapy program at Nova Southeastern University in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And you've been a licensed physical therapist since, gosh, 1995, is that? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you, were, you were a child. Uh, no. That, that all <laughs> happened. She got her PhD in physical therapy in 2003. And her credentials are amazing and immense. A certified wound specialist, advanced wound care certified, certified lymphedema therapist, internationally dual certified in lymphedema and wound care. You know, I met Dr. Hetrick at the AVLS conference last October. I had never worked with her before. And since that time, she's become a pillar in our educational webinar series. And we're just so honored to have this. But this topic today <laughs> After the first webinar Dr. Hetrick did with us, my boss, president of Lympha Press, Eric Ansart, texted me and said, you got to get her to do something with sea turtles. And I, I quizzically <laughs> said, sea turtles? What does that have to do with lymphedema? Right. <laughs> and here we are today. And you will find out the answer to that question. I want to let all of you know that today's webinar is being recorded. And you will be able to have access to it in the next week. We'll have it uploaded to our YouTube channel as well as on our website. And everybody who registers will receive a link to the replay. Please do think of your questions and put them in the Q&A. And while we're getting ready to tee up here too, let us know who you are in chat. Say hello. We're excited to hear from you. We know that people log on from all over the country and even the world for these webinars. So please do say hello. And with that, Dr. Hetrick, sea turtles, skin and space, What's the connection? <laughs> well, thank you, Brenda, so much. Such a kind introduction. And honestly, the honor is mine. I, I love getting to present on behalf of Lympha Press on some topics I'm absolutely just passionate about and um, excited to, to share this information with you. And hopefully after this presentation today, you will understand that these things are connected surprisingly and, and how this whole thing got started. So um, yes, we're gonna talk about sea turtles, skin and space, what the connection is. And uh, today what I'm hoping to do is kind of a review with you, cause it's always good to just do a little bit of a review, uh, hu the human lymphatic system. So just a brief overview of the anatomy, the physiology and their purpose. And what's interesting is we're learning more about um, some of the newer purposes behind the lymphatic system, which we'll share. Uh, I'll talk about um, a little bit about the lymphatic system in green sea turtles. And um, I'm still kind of grappling with some of the information I'm learning about these sea turtles because it's just, it makes my mind blow. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. If you were on a previous um, webinar, um, I introduced the concept of the veil. So I'm gonna pull that back in because it's very relevant to what we're talking about today. Then we're gonna move into talking about the impact of gravity that um, it has on the body systems because we're learning more and more about that. And then finally, we'll wrap it up by talking about the connection between sea turtles, skin and space. And really what it comes down to, like a lot of things that I do with respect to research, it's pattern recognition. And a lot of times we, um, when things seem really unlikely to be related, we actually find they have a lot in common. And so that's kind of what we're experiencing here with the sea turtle skin in space. So I'm gonna start by just kind of comparing a little bit the difference between sea turtles and or turtles and, and human lymphatics. So there are many, many differences. Obviously one we're talking about reptiles and another we're talking about humans. 
Um, but interestingly, reptiles, except for the snapping turtle, don't have lymph nodes. And this is something, honestly, that keeps me up at night because I can't understand how this system works without lymph nodes, but they don't. So our sea turtles that we're going to be talking about today, the green sea turtles, do not have lymph nodes. So just keep that in mind. They actually have structures called lymph hearts. And these are pulsatile organs that function really to propel lymph directly into the venous system in various aspects of the turtle um, anatomy. Now in humans, we all know that our fluid is managed by the lymphatic system and the lymphatic system alone. And it's introduced or reintroduced directly into the venous system up here at that thoracic duct after it's been cleansed and um, processed essentially by the lymph nodes. Now remember these turtles that we're gonna be talking about today do not have those lymph nodes. So one of the questions and one of the things we're trying to figure out is how does the fluid in the turtle uh, get cleansed? So we're just gonna do a little bit of a brief review on the anatomy, physiology, and purpose of the lymphatic system just to kind of get some standardization across the board. So you might've seen this presentation or this slide before, but I do like analogies, uh, at least it helps me learn. But we're gonna talk about um, how the lymphatic system is really the body's drainage or recycling system, right? And so when you look at this picture here of the schematic of the skin and then the skin um, broken down and into the different layers, so you can see the epidermis and then the dermis kind of appear by this, um, this circle. So we've got our epidermis and our dermis and then all the structures below that. One of the things that we'd like to focus on is is they pulled out here for us these, this lymphatic dermal capillary network. And to me, they look like trees, right? Almost kind of like palm trees because I'm in South Florida. So these, these dermal lymphatic capillaries are bi-directional. So they can open and move and propel fluid really in, in, in pick it up from all different directions within the dermis. And what they do is they collect that fluid, then they take it, um, that fluid is then taken down these pre-collectors, which are kind of like a tree trunk, if you will, to these large um, lymphatic capillaries. These large lymphatic capillaries lie parallel with our deep veins and our arteries. And these structures, these deep lymphatic capillaries, are, or excuse me, collectors are valved. So they are, will allow that one-way flow of lymph to regional lymph nodes. Now, this is a lot like an analogy of our sewer systems in our cities, right? So imagine your neighborhood where you live and all the homes or apartments or whatever in that neighborhood have bathrooms, right? And those bathrooms collect all the waste products and take them down to the city sewer system. So we've got all the waste products being picked up like our, by our lymphatic capillaries, right? Our bathrooms taken down to the city sewer system by these pre-collectors or the, the sewer pipes to the um, main sewer system, which would essentially be the uh, lymphatic collectors. And what happens in with sewage or <laughs> recycling um, for that matter is these large uh, water processing plants um, take all that waste products from the different communities, right? These are like kind of the, if you look at the picture over here, our, our water lines and our analogous to our lymph collectors taking all that uh, sewage to get processed in these water processing plants. And these are very analogous to me to lymph nodes, right? In their shape and their function of what they do, because they're going to clean this water, they're going to cleanse this water, and then it's going to be safe to be reintroduced back into the community's water supply or and talking about lymphatics, it's going to be cleansed and then all that fluid is going to be reintroduced back into our vascular compartment up at our venous angle. So then it's healthy and cleansed for the most part um, and reintroduced there. So this is just a really important way to kind of review the lymphatics. We now know too that uh, Starling's law has been redefined. We are very familiar with Starling's um, kind of law of the microcirculation where we have hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end of that blood capillary, which kind of forces fluid out into those interstitial spaces. And that happens. So that, that favors filtration of plasma out of those capillaries into those interstitial spaces where that fluid um, here gets picked up by these lymphatic capillaries. Now, what Starling proposed was that a combination of kind of osmotic pressure as well as oncotic pressure favored the movement of this fluid back into the capillary 
down here at the venular end. And he stated basically that 90% of that fluid was returned at the venous end, and only 10% was really returned by the lymphatics. Well, we now know that that has been um, revisited and, and we have a better understanding because of the role of the endothelial glycocalyx layer. Now, this is a structure that lines all 50, 60,000 blood vessels or all vessels of the body. It's a gel-like la uh, matrix layer. So you, there's like a gel-like adhesion layer that surrounds uh, the, the, the vessel, uh, the endothelial cell of the vessel. And then they have these hair-like projections which extend out into the lumen. So here, over here is like a, a, a close-up of those hair-like projections. And you here you can see the EGL, kind of the darker black is the gel-like layer and those hair-like projections extending into the lumen. And what this does is it acts as a molecular sieve and it regulates fluid and macromolecule movement across that endothelial cell, essentially. And it does this through mechanotransduction. So as the blood and fluids pass through that capillary, that um, triggers kind of like seaweed in the ocean, that movement of the flow mechanically transduces down through that EGL and allows that EGL to be a gatekeeper to allow that vessel to open or expand to allow more fluid to escape into the interstitial tissues. And we now know because of the way that this structure works is that there's only a diminishing net filtration across that capillary bed. So we still get hydrostatic pressure, but instead of oncotic and osmotic pressure working at the venular end, it's actually the sole responsibility of the lymphatic system. Almost over 90% of that fluid will be picked up um, by the lymphatic system, brought to regional lymph nodes where it's cleansed and processed and then reintroduced into the venous compartment. But what's important to note is that all fluid, when we're talking about fluid on in those interstitial spaces is really lymphatic fluid and that's kind of key. So the lymphatic system has been described by, as a nodal centric immunovascular system. And this is important because remember it's nodal centric, meaning that all the fluid is being picked up by all these different structures throughout the body. Um, actually all the different capillaries throughout the body and then brought to these regional lymph nodes. And they're anatomically placed in really interesting areas that are constantly compressed by mechanical movement, like range of motion, respiration, all these things. So they're constantly getting pumped to propel that fluid through so it can get cleansed and processed and then ultimately reintroduced. The other thing that's really important to remember is that the, the lymphatic system uh, not only manages the interstitial fluid environment, but it mediates immunity and inflammation. And think about all those different um, disease processes and, and conditions that involve some level of immunity and inflammation. So this again is really managed by the lymphatic system. And it is a vascular system in and of itself, but it's intimately related with the venous and the arterial system as well. And I really like this representation because it shows you that connection that it has specifically with the, vas with the venous side. Um, Dr. Roxon um, out of Stanford talk, I think has a really good analogy. And he talks about how lymphatics are the mortar, right? And when you don't have a solid mortar, you really don't have a good brick wall, right? It's prone to crumbling or breaking down. And that kind of can be what happens when we have lymphatic dysfunction or if it's not picking up the fluids properly. So again, what is this fluid? Well, all this fluid is lymphatic fluid but it is made up of you know, lots of blood plasma proteins, lipids, byproducts of tissue healing, wound healing, dead and senescent cells, cancer cells, a whole bunch of um, enzymes, white blood cells, and even bacteria, endotoxins, perfumes, dyes, and pollutants. And I think it's important to recognize that even what we put on our skin, 60% of that is actually picked up by our lymphatic system. And um, it's picked up first, if it's identified as a potential threat by our Langerhans cells in our epidermis, which then will take it down to those lymphatic capillaries to be taken away um, and, and managed by our lymph nodes. So pretty um, interesting uh, process to think about the role and responsibility that this lymphatic system has. So let's talk a little bit about um, the classic functions, right? We know how it helps maintain fluid and protein balance. That's key for what the lymphatic system does. 
And it has a safety valve where it prevents us from being swollen um, on a regular basis, right? And if you've heard my previous lecture, I talk about a normal lymphatic transport capacity is like a pickup truck, right? Large, it has a large capacity to transport. But if for some reason you don't have that pickup truck and you have a smaller car, that smaller car can still transport. It's just gonna have to work harder and faster. So that's what our, our system does all the time is try to keep that fluid and that protein in balance. We also know that it does fat absorption from the inner, inner intestinal tract. And in fact, the lymphatic capillaries that reside in our intestines are called lacteals. And I have a sneaking suspicion that somehow they may be um, the culprit behind conditions like Crohn's or IBS, um, possibly celiac, some other um, GI impairments. Um, so stay tuned for that, because that's, some, I think, an area of research we're going to be looking into a little bit more. So I think there's a link to lymphatic dysfunction with some of the GI um, issues that we see uh, presently. We also know that it does a lot with immune response to infections. Um, it really helps clean that interstitial fluid. It provides a blockade to the spread of infection and even malignant cells. Um, and it does a lot of this through those lymph nodes. But we're learning some really fascinating um, new things or newly appreciated functions of the lymphatic system. One is it does reverse cholesterol transport. And this is a mechanism in which the body removes excess cholesterol from the peripheral tissues and then delivers it to the liver. And from here, it's distributed to other body tissues or removed uh, from the body by the gallbladder. But this is kind of an important um, an, a thing to appreciate that the lymphatic system has a role with this. We also know that the lymphatic system um, is a particularly important structure as well because there's indirect regulation of brain function um, by these cerebral lymphatics called the lymphatics. And it's a network of perivascular spaces that promote the movement of cerebral spinal fluid um, into the brain and the clearance of metabolic wastes. And we're learning a lot more about this and the potential link that this might have with some of our neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's um, and other conditions along that line. And one that's really interesting is organ growth and repair. So what's fascinating is that hair follicle stem cells actually control the behavior of the lymphatic capillaries by secreting molecules that act kind of as an on-off switch for drainage for the lymphatic capillaries. And what's interesting is there's belief now that they, we may have a, a possible to solution to hair loss um, by tapping into that connection of the hair follicle and the lymphatic system um, that could actually trigger hair regeneration. So maybe we can develop um, unique manual lymphatic drainage um, techniques to trigger that connection. So maybe we can see a regrowth of hair. So ultimately I find the more and more I learn about this system, the more it's involved in things that just don't seem related. Um, but it has a role in so many different areas of human physiology um, and, and disease uh, for that matter. So, okay, great. So what does all this mean clinically? Well, let's loop back in and talk about the veil. So I think it's important to recognize that these systems, the venous, the arterial, the lymphatic, and the integumentary systems, even though we're taught about them independently, kind of in a siloed way, they're really interdependent. Um, and we know that dysfunction in one system often will lead to dysfunction or impairment in the other systems. And I think this is the key or the missing link to many ailments, diseases, and impairments actually reside within that lymphatic system. So we need to give the lymphatic system its due and really appreciate the importance of the system. And I know Lymphid Press does, they're wonderful about recognizing how important the lymphatic system is, but we need to really be better at educating all levels of healthcare providers about the importance and the role of the lymphatic system. So the veil is really just uh, the acronym for venous, arterial, integumentary, and lymphatic system. So think veil and think again how they're interconnected, they're interrelated. And they, they are so anatomically, physiologically, biochemically, um, in that they all work in unison to really help maintain homeostasis. And we really need to start teaching these systems more in the collective versus um, in, is, as independent entities, right? So I think that's really important. So what happens if the lymphatic system 
is not properly mobilizing or cleansing the fluid. Well, it's almost like if you have a free flowing river, it's just beautiful, right? It keeps everything flush and clean and, and moving. But if there's some reason why there's stagnation, so maybe there's a, a, a beaver dam or there's rocks or there's whatever that is going to be causing some type of um, impairment to that river or to that stream flow, you get stagnation. And stagnation is really not, especially when we talk about the lymphatic system, a good thing. So lymph stasis is really lymph stagnation, okay? And it's a, it, what it induces a chronic inflammatory state. So when we have that stagnating lymph load, and remember all those things I talked about that go into that lymphatic load, it's a lot of different things that are really not meant to stay anywhere for a long period of time. We need to get them out. It results in this pathohistological state of chronic inflammation. So Lymphedema really is a chronic inflammatory state, but any stagnating lymph fluid that's around for a long period of time leads to this inflammatory uh, chronicity of, of inflammation that results in these fibrotic changes. We've all seen that in these patients where you get thickening of the dermis, connective tissue proliferation. We even see um, the, the uh, triggering of adipocytes, so there's even more fatty tissue deposition. It just is a cascade of, of problems, and it's a lot like if you left milk out on the counter for too long, it's going to go bad, right? Or protein, if you leave meat out for too long, it's going to go bad. Same thing, when that fluid is out there for too long, it's going to not behave properly. And this is the result. This is, oops, this is what we see clinically as a result of lymph stasis. So this is the visual representation of lymphatic um, dermopathy or what we call a lymphatic compromise, right? A lymphatic insufficiency, or in this case, these patients all have the disease of lymphedema. So this is true lymphatic impairment, but you can see the physical manifestation of the skin changes that happen from that chronic inflammatory state. And this is, this is telltale for patients with lymphedema. So again, edema is the clinical manifestation of either an overwhelmed system or a damaged system, right? An overwhelmed system would be something like an ankle sprain and it's transient. So it's not going to last for too long. The body will be able to take back, you know, get its pickup truck back after it turns in its small car. But the other is a disease, um, and that is where that pickup truck is no longer available, and maybe we're in our small car, and now we, we get in an accident. <laughs> so that's all we have, and that's permanent. So, But both are part of this lymphatic um, or lymphedema continuum because all edema is lymphatic fluid. We know, and this is key, lymphatic impairment leads to local areas of compromised skin barrier function. And they call this lymphatic dermopathy. And this is um, by work by Carlson and Rocco, which are cited there for you. Really interesting um, articles. And what happens is when the skin can't act like, give its normal skin barrier function, so pretend it's like a suit of armor, if all of a sudden you get a chink in your suit of armor, that is a vulnerable spot, right? So lots of bad things can happen when you get a chink in your armor. Well, we know lots of bad things can happen when we get skin barrier function problems, and it can render it much more prone to breakdown and impairments. And we see this with venous disease, chronic wounds, infections, cellulitis. We also know that exercise, movement, range of motion enhances the veil collectively by promoting more optimal functioning. We know the benefits of an effective muscle pump, the fact that our nodes are placed, like I said, in areas that are constantly compressed with motion or respiration, um, and it supports the overall vascular health and integrity. So again, very mutually interdependent structures. Um, when dysfunctional, say when there's dysfunction in say the lymphatic system, it can trigger dysfunction in the venous system. We have this dual system failure, but then if you end up with a venous ulcer, then you have a tri-system failure because now the skin is involved as well. We also know disorders of the lymph system, whether systemic or localized, produce these cutaneous regions susceptible to infection, inflammation, and carcinogenesis. So this is that lymphatic dermopathy or that skin barrier failure. Um, and this explains um, kind of that pathophysiology or the propensity of why patients with lymphedema are so prone to infections such as cellulitis or hypersensitivity reactions that we see in our patients with venous disease. It's this lymphatic dermopathy, this connection between the lymphatics and the integumentary. And we also know how important a functional lymphatic system is um, because when it's not healthy, it can lead to this chronic inflammatory state.
So let's look at the veil at work. Here is a good example of lymphatic dermopathy. And looking at these two pictures, um, other than what you're seeing, do you, no do you notice that there's a difference between these? Obviously it's two different instances, but these look profoundly similar, right? But when you take a step back and put it into perspective, we're looking at relatively the same condition, but in completely different species. We have a green sea turtle on the left with fibropapillomatosis that is believed to be due to herpes. Who knew sea turtles had herpes? And here we have human papillomatosis secondary to lymphatic filariasis, which is a parasitic form of lymphedema. Um, and this was a patient I had down in Haiti who had lymphatic or has lymphatic filariasis and how it manifests um, with that lymphatic dermopathy, right? So this is lymphatic dysfunction and stagnation from different causes, right? And, and from different species, but both resulting in significant skin manifestations. So whatever the cause of the vector, I think you can appreciate the interrelationship here with the veil because we've got definitely lymphatic involvement, integumentary involvement. And when you look deeper, there is also a vascular involvement. So I think um, when I first saw this, I saw this up at a sea turtle up in Clearwater at one of the um, marine land up there, or the, um, the, I forgot the exact name of it, um, but they had a bunch of turtles in quarantine. And I was, I was saw these, these tumors and I was like, oh my goodness, this looks just like the patients I see with, with lymphatic filariasis. So we have an oceanographic center here at NSU and I reached out to some of the researchers there um, and found out that in marine biology, they believe that FP is actually caused by herpes, which is very interesting to me. So um, it's called turtle herpes or shellanoid alpha herpes virus five. So I teamed up with um, several marine biologists uh, from the Oceanographic Center here at NSU, uh, Dr. Burke Holder, as well as Dr. Milton from Florida Atlantic University and Dr. Sevick and Rasmussen from the University of Texas Healthcare Sciences um, Center, as well as several sea turtle hospitals in the area to really determine the causative factors behind FP. The prevailing belief is that it's related to this herpes virus, but my feeling is it might be more lymphatic dysfunction, and then the herpes is opportunistic. So we were very excited to start exploring this, but then we realized, well, um, there's very little known about turtle lymphatics. So we actually had to start by first imaging turtle lymphatics. So we did this using ICG, indocyanine green, and near infrared fluoroscopy imaging with my colleagues at UTC um, Health Sciences, uh, that's doctors uh, Sevick and Rasmussen. And they've done beautiful work with ICG, um, which is um, just a, an injectable protein that's picked up immediately by the lymphatics using um, a camera. And, um, and different wavelength uh, and a wavelength of light so that you, uh, near infrared light, sorry, so that you can actually visualize the lymphatics in real time. And they've been able to really map a lot of interesting things and help customize the approach to managing patients with lymphedema um, by exploring the, the unique person's own you know, anatomy and, and potential uh, pathology associated with their lymphatic impairment. So we had to start by doing this. So what we did initially was we used methylene um, blue dye. And these are some of the preliminary findings that have yet to be published. But this is a picture on the left here of a chick embryo. And I want you just to appreciate the veins, the arteries, and all this translucent webbing is the lymphatic capillaries. So again, appreciating that, that relationship anatomically with where these structures are. And then if you look at this picture, this was some of the first images ever taken of uh, sea turtle lymphatics. And what you can see are the arteries and the veins beautifully, and then outlining or surrounding those structures are the lymphatics. Again, but there were no nodes. <laughs> so this is kind of like, we're, ah, I don't know what to do with that. Um, but we're, we're continuing to explore this. Um, and from the work with uh, Sevick and Rasmussen, they really looked at showing how um, the lymphatics are damaged from venous insufficiency and the presence of venous leg ulcers. And you can see this pretty well represented here with a patient without any obvious skin impairment. But when they looked at the ICG, they found all this dermal backflow. So instead of the lymphatics picking it up and taking it through those pre-collectors down to those deep collectors, we shouldn't see any of this. We should not see or have the ability to see this ICG 
in the dermis like this because it should be immediately taken deeper where the light cannot penetrate. But we're seeing all this dermal black flow or stagnation. And this is part of that edema that we're seeing. It is the edema that we're seeing in a lot of these patients. And then in people with venous disease, this is a different patient here, you can see even surrounding the ulcer, you can see that dermal backflow. And you can see where the uptake of those lymphatic vessels are taking that fluid. And you might think, oh, well, this is great. You know, those lymph, those lymph vessels are doing wonderfully, but this is, this, we shouldn't see it. It shouldn't stay superficial like this. It should take it through those collectors, deep to those collectors. So this is all lymphatic impairment that we can see in this, in both of these extremities, even though this one's more involved with the ulcer. Now, to just reiterate that link to the veil again, there was research done in the late 90s by Wandalo, and he found that heme containing proteins, so like oxymyoglobin, hemoglobin, which lice in the interstitial tissues when there's venous disease, it creates that hemosiderin staining, right? That biological tattoo, um, that classic telltale for venous disease. He found that when these heme containing proteins are left behind in that interstitial tissue, that hemosiderin, it actually suppresses lymphatic functioning. <laughs> so again, it speaks to that connection. When there's, when there's that uh, venous impairment, it can impair the lymphatics and vice versa. So there is definitely this interconnection we need to appreciate. So then we started doing, um, I like to call them the, we were making mutant ninja turtles in the lab. Um, and these were all on living specimens. We had permits to do this. It was all IOCUC approved. Um, no, no animals were harmed in the process by doing these injections. And what you can see here on the left is a flipper of a, of a turtle. And you can see pretty good normal uptake. So it looks like there's these little circles and things. These are um, called scoots. These are the, the scales essentially on the turtle. So this is pretty, from what we can understand, pretty good uptake in the sea turtle. Now in the middle picture here, doesn't this look a lot like that lymphatic stagnation we just showed you with the venous patients? Here, this is what happened with that lymph flow around one of those tumors. So we're thinking, okay, so there's got to be some impairment with that lymphatic system when those tumors are present. And then here, this other picture here on the far right is just showing you how, you know, again, there's really no nodes that are visible. Um, just these areas of lymph hearts, um, which you can see these lymph sinuses kind of outlined here. And then there's a very large concentration of lymphatics in the gut of the sea turtle, in the mesentery of the sea turtle. We Maybe it's possible that there are enzymes or structures we just can't see that that's where this fluid is being cleansed. But basically, once this lymph gets to these... Um, lymph hearts, this is where it's propelled or pulsed into the vascular compartment directly for the sea turtle at least. So again, a lot, lot more questions than we have answers, right? But it's kind of interesting just to see um, what's happening visually in real time when we do this ICG um, near infrared fluoroscopy. So you're probably thinking now, great. So where does space come in with all of this, right? Because it's in the title of the presentation. Well, I'm glad you asked because weightlessness disrupts the functioning of the lymphatic system, especially the glymphatics. Again, going back to what we're seeing happening in the head and neck, especially of our astronauts. So we are really talking about from seafloor to space. So NEMO to LEO, right? And NEMO is NASA's extreme environment mission operations that they do underwater in the deep sea, all the way to low earth orbit, which is LEO. And we know that weightlessness, the vacuum of space, extreme temperatures, initial launch accelerative forces, tons of space debris, significant radiation, circadian disruption, and isolation and confinement are some of the very unique conditions encountered in space travel. And well above the Kármán line, uh, which is really our atmospheric space boundary, humans in spacecrafts travel at five miles a second, they witness 16 sunrises and sunsets every 24 hours as they're falling towards Earth to maintain their orbit. And we know that normal human physiology adapts to a new environment um, during this constant free fall that results in this weightlessness while orbiting the Earth. But our bodies were not developed in environments without gravity. So what we're seeing 
is the key to many physiological space adaptations may actually reside within the lymphatic system. This area has not been researched before until now, and myself and a group of colleagues are really taking, no pun intended, a deep dive um, in looking at this connection with the lymphatic system. Beautiful work has been done on the cardiovascular system in a siloed way, on the musculoskeletal system in a siloed way, on the neurodevelopmental system in a siloed way. But when we look at some of these conditions that are, are complications experienced by astronauts, we're seeing a significant problem with SANS, which is spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome, which is in a very simplistic way to put it, almost like a lymphedema of the eye. We're seeing a, a lot of DVTs happening um, in, in space, structural brain changes, and even immunologic alterations. Now I have a lot more listed up here, but the ones that I've underlined are really directly related to the lymphatics. However, these have not really been studied under the lens of the lymphatic system yet. So um, that's starting to happen, but there's a lot of negative things that can happen, even from a short exposure to weightlessness. And so one of the things that's intriguing for me and my colleagues is this condition called puffy head bird leg syndrome or moon face. Now in 1G, um, on a 1G, 70% of the body fluids reside below the level of the heart, right? When we're on earth, the lymphatic system has the capacity and the capability to transport fluid against gravity and tissue pressure gradients via the lymph vessel contractility, our leg muscle pumps, our respiratory, chest wall functions, and it creates kind of a suction effect, and they call that um, the Guyton principle, essentially. And it pumps, uh, it, it's a suction effect for pumping lymphatic fluid within the subatmospheric pressure tissue, tissue distribution zones throughout the body. Well, in weightlessness of space and loss of the 1G head to foot hydrostatic pressure gradient, astronauts experience a dramatic fluid redistribution of two liters of fluid from the legs to the head and neck within the first six to 48 hours of flight. And this kind of it persists for almost two weeks uh, while they're in space, if they're up there for that long. They feel head congestion, nasal congestion, headaches. Um, it feels like a, a, a bad cold sometimes. And there's a lot of other things that happen in this situation as well, but you can appreciate this in this picture. And sometimes this is referred to as moon space, moon face, but you can see that fluid retention, right? And so there's lots of things that are going on here. Um, uh, lots of physiological changes. But what's interesting is if you think about all the sci-fi and the movies out there, we have always represented aliens with really big heads and skinny bodies, right? And large eyes. It's kind of ironic to think this is kind of the physical manifestation of what's happening to people when they go into low earth orbit, when they don't have a, a functional lymphatic system because it doesn't have gravity to help it work effectively. This is the rub. This is what we need to figure out because we know that there are uh, a lot of uh, very key responsibilities of having functional or healthy meningeal lymphatics, right? It, it, helps, um, it helps a lot of benefits. It clears metabolites. It, function, it helps uh, as a crosstalk with the lymphatic system. It modulates cognition. It helps um, a lot of different things. When we have impaired lymphatics, but specifically the glymphatics in the brain, it can lead to an accelerated cognitive decline. We're seeing a lot of age-related um, neurodegenerative changes in, in some of these astronauts, some that are persisting, but some that are resolving. There's accumulation of um, Dow proteins and um, a lot of the other amyloid betas, which have been related back to Alzheimer's. Um, and this is compounded by the fact that on earth, we hopefully sleep in a supine position, right? And that helps the glymphatics clear the brain at night, that brain drain that is so essential to cleanse the brain, um, to get those amyloids and those metabolites out of there. But in space, it's very hard for them to achieve supine, let alone even be secure where they're sleeping. They kind of have to Velcro themselves to the wall in a sleeping bag for the most part. So think about our patients on earth though, that sleep in recliners and um, have a lot of different impairments that preclude them from sleeping in a supine position. This is important because this is what we need to, to clear that fluid out of there. So we're relating, we're seeing this happen in space, but we can attribute it to what's happening to our patients here on earth as well. So lots of problems happen when we don't have um, good or we have impaired 
um, functioning of the lymphatics. So although my, my research with sea turtles began before my involvement with space medicine, we're really beginning to appreciate how these seemingly unrelated um, issues are kind of connected. And this is, this is that pattern recognition I talked about. So it's all about form and function. Anatomy and physiology is efficient and developmentally linked to our environment, right? So we know sea turtles have an, kind of what we would call an underdeveloped lymphatic system, but they really don't need a super robust system because they, they get assistance with hydrostatic pressure of the water and the way that their architecture of their, their flippers are made of. It's a very hard material, much like well, giraffes on, on, on earth to a very fibrous connective tissue that help control uh, lymphatics. But in the sea turtle, it's, it's leatheries, right? So that's not a lot of elasticity or pliability. So that hydrostatic pressure from the water assists with function of the system coupled with their breathing, their diving, their swimming, so that movement. On land or 1G, we have a really well-developed lymphatic system that works with gravity, right? It, and in complement with gravity and respiration and mobility. In space, now when we eliminate that gravity effect, um, it doesn't function properly because uh, it can't work very well without the assistance of gravity, especially in the head and neck where they're getting, a, it's like an inverse of venous insufficiency, right? So, or um, venous hypertension. So instead of going distal, it goes proximal. And so you get a lot of this two liter head congestion um, in the head of the neck of the astronaut. So again, further hazards in space create an additional inflammatory response, which also trigger the lymphatics since we know their, their responsibility in mediating immunity and inflammation. So the lymphatics, I, me and other researchers really feel are kind of missing link here, the key um, that we need to really look into to see if we can help solve some of the problems. So we will be able to endure long-term space flight and, and maybe be able to habitate the moon or even potentially go to Mars. But honestly, until these things aren't figured, until these things are figured out, it's going to be quite a challenge or very difficult on our bodies to be able to do that. So we need to appreciate the physiologic functioning of the lymphatics and different forces of gravity. And this is an area of research that has high potential um, for astronauts and astro civilians during that long duration space flight, right? And habitation of the moon and the Mars. So we need to come up with countermeasures or, or development that carries a high potential for spinoffs or to improve treatments, even here for patients on Earth. So whatever um, you know, we can achieve in space, we can bring that back here. And, and NASA is very well known for a lot of their spinoffs, right? Like I might be dating myself, but Tang, uh, Velcro, Ziplocs, there's lots of things that have been developed for space utilization that we've actually benefited from here on Earth. And as the privatization of space industry expands, these fields of research in both Earth-based analogs and true weightless laboratories are going to continue to grow and expand as the efforts for assuring really nominal human function in these microgravity environments um, and weightlessness of space continue because we are we're moving into the realm of space stations and traveling to space, but we need to make sure that people are healthy and prepared to endure the rigors that they're going to encounter out there. You know, our astronauts are very healthy, well-trained individuals. Some of these people that can afford at this point right now to go to space may not be in as good a condition as some of our astronauts, and we just need to prepare for that potential ramification. So looking forward, the improvement of cares in the extreme environment of space is going to require a lot of people to really come together to do bench top and clinical research. And we're, we're happy to say we're starting that. Um, now, current and future plans with respect to space medicine, we're looking to develop some countermeasures for pre-flight, in-flight, and post-flight regulation of the veil, helping to create devices and element protecting, functionally enabling spacesuits to support the veil. The current spacesuits that they use when they go out and do uh, spacewalks are very hard on the body, particularly the skin. And a lot of our astronauts are encountering a lot of problems with their nails. Um, rashes are very common in space just because it, being in space triggers a whole um, immune response reaction or and the adaptive immunity is, is um, dysregulated. And again, that's part of the lymphatic system, right? There's definitely a role for nutraceuticals um, and solutions targeting the lymphatics to offset SANS, the eye condition and puffy head syndrome. And with the turtles, we're going to continue to analyze lymph fluid 
um, those that have the FP and those that are controls to see are there differences in what the, the load is? Are there alpha toxins or microplastics or bacteria that could explain the propensity for FP? Because we're seeing it just in green sea turtles. Very few other turtles ever get FP. And what's interesting is green sea turtles, they live in areas of high agricultural runoff. They tend to be more um, closer to shore and in areas where there's contaminated food and water. So this is where I think this might partially explain why their lymphatics are getting disrupted, leading to those cutaneous disruptions and then the herpes potentially being um, opportunistic, but there's still a lot of work we need to do there. The other thing we got to figure out how that lymph fluid in turtles is cleansed and regulated without those lymph nodes, because again, I can't quite wrap my head around that one. <laughs> so, and this can help us better appreciate possible solutions for people in all extremes of gravity, right? And what's interesting is the turtle carapace or the shell actually serves as a really good model for studying lymphatics in the human brain behind the skull um, using ICG uh, near infrared. So again, there's kind of that interesting link, even though you wouldn't think it's, it's related. So this presentation hopefully was really meant just to introduce a few factors um, that impact the health of the International Astronaut Corps, but also all those future astro civilians um, planning to and going out uh, for space flight, whether it's short duration or long duration. And we're hoping that the possible translation of this extensive, really expanding data set is going to better understand or help us understand the pathophysiology of our patients here, our wound patients, our um, our patients with all these different diseases because um, these other extreme environments um, and other extreme disease states have really risen to epidemic levels, right? Like diabetes, obesity, venous insufficiency. And we know, uh, particularly now, that all of these, these more common conditions are known to be concomitant with lymphedema and even lymphatic impairment. So kind of speaks to that link again. So interestingly, um, some of these we actually might figure out from sea turtles. So that's essentially the connection, hopefully, for, for sea turtle skin and space. Um, that's the end of my presentation. So I'm going to open it up now for questions. Um, I can see that there's the chat. I yes, we have that. people actively engaged in chat. <laughs> and I think with mouths agape, yes. saying, my <laughs> mind is blown. First of all, no lymph nodes no in lymph the nodes. turtles. Uh, no, not that, mm -mm, not that we can find. <laughs> That's that I ever, and for your mind to go, pew, imagine yeah. what my mind is doing. I'm so <laughs> appreciative of all the people that took time out of their day to log oh, in and be here today. It's awesome. I know we're hearing wow and chat and all of that <laughs> stuff. If you do have a specific question, feel free to put it in the Q and A. Oh, yeah. You know, when you go to our website, we have a thought leadership section and underneath it says, great minds think differently. And I think this is a perfect example of the kind of pushing the envelope thought leadership that we love to give a platform to. You said so well, give the lymphatic system its due. Oh, it and yeah. we love partnering with you in, <laughs> in that. Absolutely. Hair follicles. Yeah, who knew, right? Hair follicles. I mean, I want to call everybody I know that's had hair loss and say, <laughs> tapping into the hair follicles and the lymphatics. Yeah. I mean, that's just one whole study in itself. Yeah. yeah. You know, and anecdotally, we've seen that when doing manual lymphatic drainage on, on patients too, sometimes we see an increase in hair growth. Um, never really understood why or what was going on, but it makes sense when you, you kind of think about it. So and I'm fascinated in exploring the potential implications it might have with people with Crohn's and IBS, because if we can show there might be lymphatic impairment in that lipid absorption, that fat absorption in the gut because of the lacteals, which again are lymphatic capillaries, maybe we can do some treatments that can specifically target those areas and get these patients off some of the drugs they have to take and maybe manage those symptoms so much better. So again, the lymphatics are are just amazing. We're learning more and more about them every day, but we just really need to give, um, we really need to get more education in at the medical school level and, and all the way down because it's just not, there was a study done and they basically say about 20 minutes of, it's basically 20 minutes of lecture that they're given. <laughs> so wow. it's like, we need a lot more than that. So, well, we're yeah. so glad that yeah. you are focusing on this and 
you know, we have both patients and medical professionals on this webinar today. And there's something for everyone in all of this. I, I had to imagine too, we often hear that water exercise is so good for the lymphatics. Yeah. And then your example of how the turtles benefit from yeah. their activity yeah, in the water as well. Yeah. yeah. And you know, that's actually how, if I'm remembering correctly, in burns, um, how Jobst originally came up with the idea of using compression therapy or pressure garments, because when you're in water, even in a pool, you know, at different depths, you can feel that pressure. And it is a wonderful environment for patients to exercise in for a whole host of different reasons, but it can help patients uh, manage edema. And, and if patients don't have an open wound or anything along that line or a lot of skin issues, we recommend hydrotherapy and um, not, not whirlpool therapy, but actually swimming and, and exercising mm -hmm. in, in the water because you get the benefits of that hydrostatic pressure and then put the garments on when you get out. So there is, there is something to that for sure. Um, very, very interesting. And, um, you know, when it's almost like uh, super space when you're in the water, because you have, it's almost like hypergravity, right? Because of the mm. hydrostatic pressure. I think we've all feel that, felt that when we go deep and our ears pop or you feel that pressure, if any of you dive or do anything like that all the way to the extremes of mountaineering um, patients that are people that are going to um, Everest and all above where there's, you know, alterations in gravity and alterations in oxygenation. And it's, it's all related. It all impacts. You've connected the dots. You're continuing to connect them. We have a question from an anonymous sure. attendee. Great talk, which by the way, I'm seeing that in chat all the way through. How can we create a hypobaric chamber? Dr. Herps recommended this to help with the lymphatics and thank you in advance. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's actually, um, it, it, there's work being done on that. They're, they're doing different things where um, I believe even um, lymphopress, <laughs> you have your lymphopod, might be something yes. that can help with drawdown. There's been work done um, uh, out of uh, Dr. Hargens out of UC San Diego, um, who has done a lot of work with chambers like that to help draw down or pull fluid, even on the ISS and in space. But the problem with some of those is those chambers are very large and cumbersome and take time. Um, and it's very expensive to have any type of payload on um, ships or the ISS. It's all, I believe if I can remember correctly, it's like $10,000 a pound when you go to space and then you have to accommodate that for fuel. So they're looking for, for techniques and countermeasures that are easy to implement and more simple and doesn't, doesn't require a lot of big, robust equipment. But even our astronauts now are required to exercise two and a half hours a day with modified equipment to maintain musculoskeletal health. And they still do a tremendous amount of bone loss when they go into space. Now it's less when they exercise, but it's still something that we see. So we need new countermeasures. We need new opportunities and things like that. And whether it's um, these drawdown chambers or some type of hyperbaric, um, that, those are things we need to explore. And, and there, yeah. some of that's being actively pursued. So yeah, it's interesting. So I had to smile at your Tang reference, which I totally got because that <laughs> yeah. was my era. Yep. Yep. And <laughs> you know, when I think about how fascinated we all were back then with the yeah. thought that we were going to the moon. Right. And now here we are yeah. in a world that average citizens, yeah. wealthy ones, but yeah, for now, but hopefully it will be available right. to others soon. It yeah. will be ubiquitous yeah. Yeah. day in the future. Yeah. And here we are in the forefront of it and it has to be studied. So it, it's definitely it needs safely. to be studied. Yeah. We haven't really come up with good um, uh, ways to induce artificial gravity in space yet. So until that can happen potentially, we really need to figure out how to help support our physiology when we're in space, even if it's just for short duration. Mm. Um, Cause there, there's pushes to have, um, like I said, st uh, space-cations as I call them, where people can go to space and stay in a space hotel and orbit. And I mean, we just have to be prepared because the body is not meant to be up there. So what are we gonna do to prep the body ahead of time while we're there and even after when we come back? So lots of things to figure out, but pretty exciting at the same time. Oh, and it, it's another one of those, <laughs> Yeah. moments, just like <laughs> the lymph nodes and the turtles. Yes. A couple comments I wanted to share with you. Yeah. One of our attendees is a primary lymphedema patient with both hair loss 
and GI issues. And mm -hmm. she's very interested in this research, says, yeah. thank you for shining a light on this fascinating connection. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and thank you for being on this presentation today. I know, I know living with primary lymphedema is, is a challenge in of itself. I actually, I believe I have a secondary form of lymphedema from a lot of surgery and, and, and I understand. And I, I do think we're going to see more and more, um, connection and understanding to these things because I really do feel now it, now it's just my opinion because we need to do the research to prove this but I do believe there are connections to those GI issues and and alopecia hair loss and and other things yet to be determined that are can be related back to lymphatics so I appreciate that comment thank you I do too and yeah. I also want to go back to one thing because we're going to be running out of time shortly, but sure. you talked about what you put on your skin yeah. is picked up by the lymphatic system. And that's something that can't be overstated. Again, we have patients and medical professionals right. on this webinar. Are there any particular trigger ingredients that we should say, warning, warning? Good question. Stay away from? I, you know, my, my rule of thumb is <laughs> a couple of things. If I can't pronounce it, I really don't want to put it on my skin. <laughs> But then I would have I never been a pharmacist. <laughs> all the terms that you said so effortlessly oh. in this presentation, I, I kept thinking, Only because oh, God, I don't have to people. say them. <laughs> no, but I, I would have been a horrible pharmacist because I cannot remember drug names or, and they're complicated. But anyway, so, you know, I'll try to avoid as much as you can chemicals, additives. I prefer more natural organic based products. I try to avoid mineral oil based products I'm, or petrolatum based products. So things that might have more of an olive oil base or a coconut oil base or um, cocoa butter or um, I said olive oil. Those they're more natural and they also don't shut off the skin's respiration system and they're not going to really clog the lymphatics, if you will, like some of the other other uh, things will. But what's interesting is is we've appreciated this because when you when you consider a tattoo, right, um, it actually the ink gets injected into the dermis. But what they're finding on cadavers is the regional lymph nodes of wherever those tattoos are, the color of the tattoos, because the lymph the 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 tattoo ink is a lymph node. It gets picked up by the lymphatic system. So. If somebody has a sleeve of tattoos of all different colors, their cubital nodes or axillary nodes, possibly even some of their cervical nodes are gonna be the color of those tattoos. Now, luckily, tattoo ink nowadays is, is not um, toxic <laughs> like it used to be. And I'm saying thank you. I'm really <laughs> yeah. glad to know. Yeah, it's not lead-based anymore, but it's, it's interesting to appreciate. Again, shows you that connection, right? Between the skin and, and the lymphatics. And so um, just important to keep in mind um, those types of things, but yeah, I, you know, that's why your skin is so important to keep healthy hydration. We cannot speak enough about staying hydrated, water, 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 water. Um, it's good for the skin. It's good for the lymphatics. It's good for your cells. I mean, they always say a dry cell is a dead cell, right? So water is really important. Um, uh, keeping your skin lubricated and moisturized and clean. All of those things can really help limiting your exposure to, to pollutants, um, all of those things can, can definitely help. Yeah. So we have time for one more question. Sure. And we are so delighted that Dr. David Kawanishi is with us today. He's the director of the Vein Lab at Mission Heritage Medical Group in oh, Mission wonderful. Viejo, uh, California. We're so glad you're here. His question, when interstitial pressure problems due to lymphatic dysfunction occur, is the lymphatic problem just functional or there are there associated structural changes in the lymphatic vessels? That's a fabulous question. And not to be vague, but I'm going to say potentially both. <laughs> mm. And the reason why I say that is if we look at it from the lymphedema continuum again, so um, we can have a functional impairment with the lymphatic system where maybe it's not pumping properly, maybe it's not picking up enough fluid properly, but that can be temporary. It can, it can overcome that. That's kind of like, I go back to that ankle sprain analogy, right? But when there's true structural impairments with that lymphatic system, so maybe there's um, a hypoplasia or a hyperplasia of those lymphatic structures, we see that a lot with different forms of primary lymphedema. So the system's not developed properly, it's either underdeveloped or overdeveloped, but not functional. Or like with secondary lymphedemas, a lot of them are associated with trauma. So whether it's 
a lot of uh, surgical interventions or scar tissue or radiation therapy or lymph nodes resections or all these different things, bacterial infections, viral infections can lead to a functional deficit in the lymphatic system that can lead to the disease of lymphedema. So sometimes both can occur. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know, are we dealing with a structural or a functional problem? But the beauty behind the lymphatic system is how adaptable it is. Um, and that's why I think a lot of times, um, if you have the ability to have access to lymphedema therapists, they can really help because we're trained on how to rework the lymphatic system, how to, how to redirect fluid around structurally or functionally impaired areas to more functional structurally functional areas, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, just learning more about how the system works, how to, how to work with the system, depending on how it's presenting. And it's a very forgiving system for the most part. So I think, um, great question. Um, yeah. I hope that helpfully answered some of it, but it's, it's a, it's a very forgiving system to a point, but we really need to protect it and we need to research it more and we need to just have more people certified as lymphedema therapists out there because the sheer number of people that need need help are, it's Yes, it's oh, and we have much respect for the certified lymphedema therapists that are out there today. Thank you for logging on. Patients, medical professionals, Dr. Hetrick, <laughs> once again, a brilliant presentation. And before we close, you know, Lympho Press believes in educating and inspiring the lymphedema, lipedema communities, mm -hmm. and we offer thought-provoking webinars every month. Next month is Lipedema Awareness Month. Excellent. Every week we have something going on from the genetic underpinning of lipedema. We're starting out with Dr. Tara Carnesis from Australia. She's Wonderful. kicking off Lipedema Awareness Month. Dr. Herbst is ending it up with a whole talk on cooling the fire within inflammation and lipedema, and then other brilliant activities in between please join us. We're thankful that you're here. You will all get a copy of this presentation and we look forward to working with you again in the future, Dr. Hedrick. Thank Everyone. You. Thanks for doing these. You're giving um, such a community service. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. It is a pleasure and a joy and Lympho Press loves partnering with brilliant people like yourself. Well, so thank you. My have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.